Come on, hold this. You like one of this? Can I go blow around though? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you all so much for coming out to join us this evening. My name is Jesse Letterman. I'm one of the environmental organizers with Arise for Social Justice, and it's an absolute honor to be here with all of you. For some of us, this is a fight that has been ongoing for almost eight years. And for a lot of us, it's a fight that's very close to each and every one of our hearts, because many of us live here in the city of Springfield. Many of us live here in this neighborhood, and the rest of us live across the Pioneer Valley. And we're acutely aware of the impacts that this incinerator could have on our public health, the public health of our children, the public health of our seniors, and the environment of the world that we live on. Right. And so we're here today to have a conversation about the status of the biomass incinerator, where we're at legally, where we're at as a community, and what we need to do going forward to continue to stand up and block this incinerator. Exactly five years ago this week, the Springfield City Council heeded the calls of the people and acted in the best interest of our public health and safety by revoking the special permit for Palmer Renewable Energy's proposed biomass incinerator. And many neighbors, including a lot of us here, thought that after a years long battle to stop this incinerator that never should have been permitted in the first place, we thought it was over. But thanks to the expert work of corporate lawyers down in Boston, the outside developers who stand to profit from this incinerator are closer than ever to seeing it constructed. Now make no mistake, We've won a lot of battles in this fight. The permit revocation, the moratorium on construction and demolition debris, and gaining the support of nearly every elected official in the city of Springfield and every neighborhood council. But since the beginning, neighborhood residents and elected officials and health organizations have raised concerns about the impact of this incinerator on public health. And the processes that we have gone through to stop it are not necessarily required to take public health into account in their decision-making process. But there is one body that is, and that is the Springfield Public Health Council. The Springfield Public Health Council in January held a hearing to determine whether to hold a site assignment hearing and consider the impact of this incinerator on the health of Springfield. The Health Council has authority under state law to review this incinerator and if appropriate to apply mitigation tactics or to block its construction. This process has been used in other communities. But nearly five months later, the Public Health Council has continued to not make a decision of whether or not to hold a hearing. And do we think that could have something to do with the fact that the same corporate lawyers that have been attempting to force this incinerator on the people of the city of Springfield are now threatening the Public Health Council with an unprecedented and unsubstantiated $150 million lawsuit if they move forward. We're here. We're here today to tell the Springfield Public Health Council to stand up to the threats of these corporate bullies and do their job to protect the health of our city of Springfield. What do we want them to do? Do their jobs. What do we want them to do? Do their jobs. This year, Springfield's air quality was again rated an F by the American Lung Association, and we continue to see some of the highest childhood asthma rates in the state. In our opinion, and the legal opinion of many professionals of the law, not only is the Public Health Council have the authority to hold a site assignment hearing, but they are obligated to hold a site assignment hearing. Right. Now make no mistake, biomass developers are not the only people who can take advantage of the court system and file lawsuits. And that's why we're here to say that should the Springfield Public Health Council fail to do their jobs and hold a site assignment hearing, we will put together a coalition of residents from the city of Springfield and we will sue them in court and file suit for failure to carry out their responsibility to protect our public health. 
We are also joining the call originally made by the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards to call for the City of Springfield and the Public Health Council to hire independent legal counsel to advise the Public Health Council during the site assignment process. It is time that the City of Springfield stood up and followed the rule of law, not just when it's convenient for corporate polluters, but when it is to protect the health of our residents. Good idea. So I want to thank some of our colleagues in government who have long been big supporters of this opposition and have helped us a lot. Uh, we have a couple members of the City Council here. I know City Councilor Tim Allen had to leave, but he was here. We also have City Councilors Adam Gomez and a longtime opponent, City Councilor Orlando Ramos, who's going to join us to say a few words. Just wanted to come out here and say um, thank you for putting this event together. Thank you for keeping the pressure on. This is a very important issue here in the city of Springfield. For those of you who don't know, I represent Ward 8, which is this area here. This proposal is in my district, and so this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I'm also joined by my colleagues, as Jesse said, um, Councilor Allen, who had to leave, and Councilor Gomez, who is here, uh, present. So after talking to Councilor Allen, I got a little bit of the background. I wasn't on the council the first time that, they, that we voted to overturn the, the special permit, uh, but I was on the council a few years later when we voted to appeal of the court's decision. And, uh, uh, and I was very vocal about that. I'm very proud of that vote that I took, and we will continue to keep the pressure on. And this is something that we have to do together. And so I appreciate all of your support. After talking to my colleague, one of the things that, I'm, uh, that I wanted to announce today is that uh, in the upcoming meeting, uh, Monday, June 6th, I will be sponsoring a resolution on behalf of the City Council asking the Public Health Council to do their job. And I'm hopeful that you all can be present for that meeting because, like I said, this is a, this is a very important issue to the City of Springfield, very important to the future of the City of Springfield. So thank you. Thank you for not letting up and thank you for not giving up. We're going to have Claire Miller from Toxics Action Center to give us an update on where the state regulations are at and some of the attacks that are coming on those now to make it easier for corporate polluters to come into our communities. Claire. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's such an honor to be here. My name is Claire Miller. I'm the lead community organizer with Toxics Action Center. Sorry, I always do that. Talk right into the mic. Talk right into the mic. Yes. Okay, I'm Claire. I'm the lead community organizer with Toxics Action Center. We're a public health and environmental nonprofit, and it's our mission to work side by side with communities that are working to clean up and prevent pollution. So, you guys. Um, and I, you know, just feel so honored to be here today. We've been working side by side with you all for the last eight years. You've done incredible work. Um, and there's three things that I want to say today. So, number one is, yeah, the PHC, the Public Health Council, really, really needs to do its job. Um, I get to crisscross the state and work with concerned citizens around their kitchen table in their church basement. The health board, the board of health, is one of the most powerful tools that every community I get to work with has. It's absolutely outrageous that this public health council has not stood up yet and taken the decision to do this site assignment. They can, they should, they must for your air, for your lungs. It is so important and I am so happy to hear there's a resolution on Monday to encourage them to stand up and do their job. That is number one. I have seen it work. I have seen public health councils actually stand up to corporate bullies. Number two is that, yes, biomass is bad for our climate. It's made out of carbon. <laughs> um, and, you know, thinking about what is the state and the federal context that we're living in, you know, we are... We are seeing the old and dirty coal-fired power plants retire. That's awesome. We're seeing the old and dangerous nuclear power plants retire. That's awesome. The thing is, is our governors are kind of terrified of the actual future, of actually seeing a million solar roofs across our region, of seeing offshore wind, and going, oh my god, I don't know, this seems challenging. It's so different from like a giant biomass plant. And so to them, you know, they see this as like the easy way out. I want to keep the lights on with this kind of easy way to do it, to a giant smokestack. And so there's actually things in motion. Governor Baker is talking to Governor Page up in Maine and saying, you know, maybe we could make a deal. Maybe we could make this seem more renewable. Yeah. No, no, uh -uh. No. So, you know, when you, if you get a chance to talk to Governor Baker, you 
you let him know biomass is not good for our climate. It is not renewable, um, and we need to see real solutions. The last thing I want to say is that we can and we will win. Over our 29 years at Toxic Action Center, we have seen time and time again hundreds of communities all across New England get a small group of people together, organize, get their voices heard, get together, and they make polluters be held accountable. They get government to do the right thing. And so I know in my heart of heart that we are gonna win this, and I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you. Time when biomass was very popular and considered renewable, unfortunately, and a bunch of them got built. One of the places that bought into that was the state of Maine. We have somebody here from Maine, and Hillary Lister is going to come up to tell us how that worked out for them. Hey, Hillary. Yeah, Hillary. Thank you very much. It's good to be down here. So I'm down here visiting my mom who lives in the hospital here, but I'm from Athens, Maine, where one of the first biomass incinerators was built in the 70s. There were a number of incinerators built in Maine under Carter's Energy Act that qualified biomass as renewable energy and gave subsidies for building these burners ostensibly to just be burning waste wood from the forest that would otherwise, according to our former governor Baldacci, be polluting our rivers if we just left it in the woods. <laughs> So that resulted in all sorts of clear cuts all over the state and then they started realizing it was cheaper with all the surrounding states having a lot of extra construction waste to start substituting construction waste for the wood they were burning in the incinerators. The town where I live in Athens, we had a biomass incinerator, it had been burning plain wood from the 80s. And then in 99, they got a minor amendment to their air emissions permit to start substituting up to 50% of that wood to be construction demolition debris, which can include PVC, uh, pressure treated wood, painted wood, plastics, everything from demolishing a building. After September 11th, the fuel pile next to the incinerator grew from about an acre to 15 acres full of construction waste. In February 2002, that pile of construction waste for the biomass burner internally combusted and started smoldering. And remember, this is PVC plastics, treated wood, everything in that pile. Um, the company that was in charge of reporting this to the DEP to do something about it, they didn't bother to because they were the ones delivering the debris. So this ended up going on for six weeks, smoldering. Um, the school ended up having to do indoor recess. A number of people I know ended up in the hospital. People still today have heart problems, asthma, lung problems that happened when, that started at that time. We were finding dead birds around during that time. Finally, local neighbors going to the state, going to the media, got this shut down. Unfortunately, once it was shut down, the government gave them a fine that they were able to pay off by donating the incinerator to Old Town, where that was going to somehow save the mill in Old Town. Um, so that took, we ended up getting in touch with the people in Old Town, who it's a similar little community. In all of these cases, these are communities without lots of money, without lots of lawyers, which don't have the connections to be able to fight this sort of stuff. They're not citing this stuff in Northampton. They're not citing this stuff in Portland. They're citing this stuff in low-income communities, communities of color. Um, when I went to EPA Environmental Justice Conference, there was a former industry consultant who commented that one of the first things they look at when citing an incinerator, well, the first two things are educational level of the town and the neighborhood they're citing in and the income level. And that really is, we have we're communities that are being targeted as sacrifice zones and Springfield has been repeatedly targeted as a sacrifice zone. Um, so we got the incinerator shut down in Athens, however, a year later the governor's brother came to town looking for a tax break to build a new state-of-the-art biomass incinerator that would somehow cause no pollution, similar to what's being proposed and marketed here in Springfield. Um, we ended up having rallies like this on the, at the four corners in town every weekend through the middle of the winter. We ended up going to the media. We ended up having a big rally at the state house where we shut down the House of Representatives. So you got to keep fighting this stuff, and it does work. In Athens, we ended up getting a moratorium that eventually went in as a town ordinance that bans the commercial burning of construction waste. They did end up building a pellet mill and are now building a biomass burner next to the pellet mill to provide fuel. They're saying they can't burn construction waste in this right now because they're getting their renewable energy credits from Massachusetts and Connecticut, which have 
stricter rules around what qualifies as class one renewable energy. Just jumping back a minute, while they were trying to build this incinerator in Athens, they were also working on changing state law to qualify burning construction waste in these biomass incinerators as a form of class one renewable energy, eligible to for 40 times the amount of money that they would get for burning a regular, basically, trash. Um, this is something that the state has been pushing to expand to other states. Maine is the only state in the Northeast that, where burning construction and demolition debris qualifies as class one renewable energy. And for general wood burning biomass, all the surrounding states have much stricter standards. However, as a lot of you have heard, there's pressure now coming from Maine for Massachusetts to change its standards. Because since Maine has classified so much stuff as class one renewable, the value in Maine of these credits has dropped. So now the facilities in Maine are looking to states like Massachusetts and Connecticut that have high value credits in order to sell their power. So Massachusetts could be paying for a biomass burner in Maine and meeting their renewable energy standards. Right now, with Massachusetts DEP's rules are tightening up what qualifies, the facilities in Maine aren't qualifying. However, the Biomass Power Association is based out of Portland, Maine. They're a big lobby group based out of Bernstein Shore, uh, former Governor King, that's his law firm. Um, and they have been working with Senator Susan Collins, Maine Senator in D.C., to get federal recognition for burning biomass and construction demolition debris as clean renewable energy and as a solution to climate change. They've definitely had some success. This is definitely not a single party issue. I know the Republicans get highlighted for this, but this came into Maine initially through the Democrats. The Biomass Power Association and their member groups equally contribute to the Democrats and Republicans. And I just want to encourage everyone, because this is going on all throughout New England, Pay attention to what's going on in the state house here and definitely be in touch with organizers in other states. I brought this here, I went to, this was the, the Solid Waste Association of North America had their international conference in Portland two years ago. This was one of the little freebies. It says waste con on it. It's a little stress ball that's the Capitol Dome. So when industry people are stressed out, they can take their stress out on your local state capitol. They have more lobbyists. <laughs> yes. The waste industry, which this really is the waste industry that's pushing this. They have more lobbyists in Maine State House than anything other than the pharmaceutical industry. I guess that would be similar here in Mass, but I'm not sure. But it's really important to find out who is working on this and work right now, it's an election year, work with candidates, find out where they stand on this. If they're opposed to this, then work to get them elected and try and get some legislation in. Being, be on the watch for a lot of new stuff that's going to be introduced this year because Every year in Maine, they are trying to expand what can be burned to expand the amount of money these facilities can get. Um, they just passed a subsidy to give 14 million away to Re-Energy, which is the largest construction waste processor in the country to burn construction waste in Maine. They, they own two operations in Maine. Covanta, which is one of the largest waste companies in the country, they own two other incinerators in Maine. So they're right now putting pressure on Governor LePage and Senator Susan Collins to get to meet with Massachusetts and get Massachusetts to change its standards. This is only, we're only going to be able to stop this by working together throughout the region. I'd be happy to talk to anyone after about how we can continue to do this. And it's amazing to see this fight going on and being successful and awesome work. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> is not just under attack in Springfield. Public health isn't just under attack in Springfield. This is a, a worldwide issue. And so we're going to have uh, Beth Adams come up to give us a little bit of information about a proposal that's happening in Berkshire County, but is very much tied to what is going on here. So Beth, can you give us a little update? Thank you. Uh, let's see, the chant is keep them in the forest, keep them in the ground. So if I say keep them in the forest, you say keep them in the ground. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Okay, and of course, by them, you know what we mean. The trees. <laughs> so uh, we're, uh, there are a group of us that are getting together to uh, work to stop the statewide 
uh, efforts to deforest um, our trees through the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership. Maybe some of you have heard about it. If you go to Mohawk Trails Woodland Woodlands Partnership info, Janice Sinclair has put together a great website with information for you on that. But basically, it's a $23 million project that they're using. They're taking energy money that would go for solar and wind and putting it into this uh, fiasco. Uh, debacle really mm -hmm. so all we have to do is follow the money the rich forested lands of central and western Massachusetts including particularly Franklin and Berkshire County are in danger of being deforested investors and corporations buy it because investors and corporations to them their co trees are commodities to be used for the purposes of making a profit. Timber companies, energy contractors, and foresters stand to take advantage of the federal and Massachusetts energy subsidies available for, quote, renewable energy. Boo! <laughs> we know that forests do not provide renewable energy because it takes at least 20 years for a tree to grow back if it can make its way through the invasive species that have filled into the space. But these industries have spent millions to deceive legislators and the public to believe that they do. In the meantime, taxpayers and all species supported by a connected ecosystem have been deprived of the carbon sink and nutritional cycles that a forest provides. We know that these very funds, these millions of dollars, are needed to retrofit buildings and to develop environmentally acceptable wind and solar projects that will no longer pollute or negatively impact climate change. Lastly, Berkshire and Franklin County forests contain Native American burial sites that are protected by a little known Massachusetts law. Once maintained for thousands of years by the tribes who lived here, the Nipmuc, the Agwam, Housatonic, Narragansett, Abenaki, Wampanoag, Massachusetts, so Squawky, and many, many more, the whole land was filled with Native peoples. MGL 114 C17 says, basically, in much more eloquent way, that these burials, even if they're just suspected, are not to be touched. People can't even go on land to see what's there. They are not to touch it. We must stop Palmer Renewable Energy's attempt to make matters worse for people and the planet by converting their facility to biomass burning. It will not allow the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act standards to be met and thus will violate the law. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Keep them in the forest. Keep them in the ground. Thank you. Thank you. So glad you came out with us. We're going to have a woman wrap us up here who is a woman that I've known for most of my life. Many of you have known her for much longer than I've been alive. And I think we can all safely say that she is one of the goddesses of activism in the city of Springfield. I don't know. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our executive director from Arise, Michael Ambusey. Well, people have really covered a lot of territory here, so I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Um, but I want to talk about Palmer Renewable Energy again for a minute, because they are going to pollute. They just got a state permit because they're polluting within acceptable levels. So the question is, acceptable to who? Is it acceptable to the people who are going to have to put up with this? And they only judge the air quality. What about the exhaust from the trucks, the noise? You know, doesn't this have an impact on people's physical and mental and emotional well-being? I know that it does. Um, so we are not giving up. I got to tell you, I, w I went back today and looked at the very first email 
that we ever sent as a group, and it was December 2008. So that's like eight years ago, and they still haven't built the plant. Yeah. So we are not giving up. We're going to keep going. I just want to make one other point. I don't know if anybody saw this, but back in March, three businesses that operate on Bondi's Island, um, the biggest one, which is Berkshire Power, was fined by the EPA for $8 million. Now, why were they fined? Because they jerry-rigged their pollution controls. And they actually polluted for years before they got caught. So I'm not going to say for sure that Palmer Renewable Energy will do that, but we know that it happens. And the best way to make sure it doesn't happen is to stop them now. So hang in there, everybody. Thanks for coming.